Hello, and welcome to my little corner of the internet. Millions of people have derived artistic fulfillment and professional success from the art of photography since it was first brought to the public market in the late 1830s by Louis Daguerre and his daguerreotype process. This was the birth of what we now call black and white photography, and from here on I believe most people assume that the evolution from black and white to color closely related to the jump between mediums in Hollywood. And while, yes, that's pretty much the case, it is a bit more interesting than that. Lies, deceit, Nobel Prizes, the fall of communist governments, and absolute market dominance all lie within the tale of the exploration and invention of color photography. Kind of. Our story begins in the early 1850s with Levi Hill, a jack of all trades who I could honestly make an entire video about, but in short, he started his career as an apprentice printer. When reaching his early 20s, he felt he had been called to serve the Baptist ministry, which unfortunately didn't pay very well, so he used his printing skills to make Baptist tracks to supplement his income. No, not chick tracks, but that's kind of the idea. Less guilt was needed at the time. Soon, however, poor old Levi would suffer from bronchitis, making his preaching work too difficult for him to continue, which started him down the path of becoming a daguerreotypist. And just like in his ministry, Mr. Hill began printing books and columns about the daguerreotype process, opening up the world of photography for hobbyists and not just career men. His columns became very successful due to instruction manuals not really existing before this point, and the process not being widely taught, or at least cheaply taught. And it would be in these pamphlets that Levi Hill would announce that through experimenting with daguerreotype, he had been able to achieve realistic colors, subsequently dubbing it heliochromy. And the announcement had met intensely mixed results. On one hand, consumers are excited to have portraits in color, and America is on the brink of a new leap forward in technology. On the other hand, consumers are having their portraits postponed until they can have them heliotyped much to the chagrin of photographers who would like to maintain a steady income. And no one has actually seen this process yet. Levi has just claimed he can do it and vaguely shown some results, both of which lead to a large portion of the photographers of the time to doubt the legitimacy of Hill's work, to claim his realistic color photos were painted, as well as just generally disrespect him which unfortunately only got worse when he finally did release a book containing his recipe for the helotype process. With the release of a treatise on heliochromy, in 1856, readers were slapped in the face with a 37-page autobiography and then almost another 150 pages of long, convoluted, complicated, and confusing instructions on how he had achieved his effect. Turns out Levi Hill was having a difficult time producing shades that were not washed out or difficult to decipher, as well as yellow shades at all. Far from realistic. To cover this up, he had in fact been painting his photos to embellish the results, like his contemporaries had accused. In the present day, we have been able to test Levi's photos and verify that without paint he was in fact taking some of the first color photos to exist. However, it is still likely that what the world believed soon after Hill's death in 1865 was the truth. Hill was once able to produce color photos, but he had done so by accident and was physically unable to reproduce his results no matter how hard he tried. George Littman was a well-accomplished physicist whose body of work includes piezoelectricity, which has helped humans gather electricity from kinetic energy, improving the measurement of time by averaging pendulums, and of course, the advancement of color photography. To say I understand the process in which Littman used would be a bold-faced lie. From what I understand after reading Wikipedia, he was able to develop a single emulsion that sat between a glass plate and mercury. The reflection of the light off of the mercury would then create an image in the emulsion that stuck to the glass plate. And that's just hard for me to imagine. What really helped me at least wrap my head around the idea was a video by YouTuber user John Hilty, who tried to reproduce Lippmann's photos without using mercury but with gal galinistan instead. It fills my heart with hope that people like John exist and are just doing the coolest shit on the planet. So if you want a clear idear of the process, please watch that. Link in the description. With this breakthrough 
Gabriel Littman would be awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. However, it still had problems for those wanting to use it practically. For one, he was unable to transfer the images to paper. The picture was still stuck in the glass that it had been created on, and the emulsions themselves were designed in a way to record details smaller than light, making the emulsion much less light sensitive, which of course means a longer wait time until the image gets exposed onto the plate. As well as another big issue, despite John Hilty being able to iterate on his results, even some of the smartest of the early 1900s were having issues following his method. Only there was an easier way. And in comes James Clerk Maxwell, who was yet another physicist. He had been doing a lot of work with understanding humans' ability to see color, most notably the young Helmholtz, or trichromatic theory, explaining that humans can only differentiate between three colors because of cone cells on the back of our eyes that perceive either red, green, or blue. And in an attempt to make a visual demonstration, he took three black and white photos of the same subject with red, green, and blue filters respectively. He then projected those photos on top of each other and the human eye would register them as being in full color, shocking the world as well as the entirety of the photographic community. And this was exciting. While the need for better ways of rendering the colors, especially green and red, still existed, this was a way to produce color images without confusing and complicated emulsions. Not using any new emulsions at all, it was all the tried and true black and white process. The most interesting, in my opinion, to use the three color technique introduced by Maxwell was Sergei Porkudin Gorsky and his mentor Adolf Meath. Meath had created a camera that would take photos of a single subject. Sergei would use likely that very camera to travel the late Russian Empire and take photos documenting as much as possible. The Tsar of the Empire enjoyed the idea so much, Sergei had pretty much unrestricted access to most places civilians did not, and was given a specifically made darkroom train car. And that's what Sergei did from 1910 to 1915. He took thousands of photos across his time traveling the Russian Empire, which unfortunately fell during the Russian Revolution just a few years later. A majority of his photos were purchased by the Library of Congress, and there was a book published displaying them, the stories behind the photos, as well as his journey. It was actually what made me want to make this video. If you still want to learn more about this book specifically, as it is the first large collection of color photographs to exist, but you don't want to read it for yourself, there is a great video by Mackerel Phones going through it. Returning to the more technical advancement of color photography, the Lumiere brothers, August and Louise, were the first to introduce color photography to the masses with their autochrome Lumiere process, patented in 1903. And this is when color photography became available to the public in a commercial way. The process for the consumer was a pretty easy one. The plates were sold in packs of four and you just stuck them in your camera and fire away. They took longer to expose than other emulsions of the time, so a tripod had to be used. But for color photos, this was the best, easiest, and most accessible it had ever been. If you see any color photos from before the Great Depression, there's a pretty good chance that they were taken with autochrome plates. The construction of the plates was, like the other processes, a complicated one I am likely going to butcher. From what I understand, however, what sets it apart is the slide was covered in a dyed potato starch that formed grains. These grains would act as pixels, eerily similar to today's Bayer filter, and would filter out the light of particular colors exposing the silver halide layer beneath the grains. And after the process of removing the halide, only the dyed starch grains were left, creating the photo. Supposedly, these need more light to view than other glass plates at the time. Because I'm not made of money, I think I'm going to have to trust Wikipedia and work with my sample size of one. But it does make sense. If the color of each pixel is predetermined and will only be activated if that shade passes through it, then that will leave a lot of grains nearly unused. And as at least I can see, it is painfully dim. It's likely that also most other screen plates needed less light because autochrome actually had a black dust called lamp black in between all of the colored grains to stop light leaks and to allow only the light to pass through the colored grains to expose the image. And because all of the colored grains exist on the same layer, there are dark spots where no light was exposed, leaving a larger space in between light colors than in soon-to-be-discussed methods. And since we've been discussing relevant books, 
There are a set of 12 books called uh, Luther Burbank and his methods and discoveries and their practical applications, which were supposedly some of the first books to have printed color photos in them. I have a few here. And there seems to be a bit of contention surrounding these at the time. Although all of that is about his work as a botanist and not about the value of the photography. It's important to remember that the um, books by Sergei weren't printed until after the uh, Library of Congress uh, got a hold of them, I believe. And that was a pretty brief, very dumbed down version of the screenplay era of color photography. It's figurehead cemented in history, the knowledge gained of emulsions and lessons learned are still in practice today. If you want to learn more or see what little survives of the craft of plate photography, I highly recommend you check out the YouTube channel Marcus Hofstadter. He does a type of photography with aluminum plates originally developed in 1852, I believe. It's a really interesting process that I was not only excited to see someone keep alive, it also helped me realize that while it is tragic that few of these art forms still exist or are in practice today, the photography that dominated the 20th century was just as exciting and a hundred times more accessible to the general public. And that format is called Film ditched the large and cumbersome glass and metal plates and began smearing the emulsions on a long plastic sheet that could be stuck into canisters or reels. This made film lighter as they weren't hauling around several sheets of glass, more compact as the film was spooled on a roll and gave photographers the opportunity to take more than one shot at a time. Now film itself had been around in several shapes and sizes since the late 1880s, entirely existing as a black and white medium, and 35mm was just one invented by a Thomas Edison employee. William Kennedy Laurie Dickinson by slicing apart a 70mm roll in half. Although its modern iteration with the perforation on both ends was created by Eastman Kodak and used for motion pictures. Due to Kodak's success in the motion photography game, 35mm soon became one of the most popular formats for just about everything, and it didn't take long for people making stills cameras to capitalize on the ad format's advantage of abundance. A few iterations of the 35mm camera existed, but the one to really popularize the format for photography was the release of the German-made Leica 1 in 1925. An update more relevant to us followed in 1935, Kodachrome 35mm rolls building off the idea of the tripack as introduced by Louis de Coste du Haron. The tripack was three color sensitive emulsions squeezed together on a plastic bag, very similar to the film of the not too distant past. Kodachrome's story is again a pretty wacky one, invented by two professional musicians, Leopold Godowski Jr. and Leopold Manns, who both also just so happened to have studied physics and chemistry at UCLA. To say these two were superhumans would be underestimating them. For 14 years, they worked in their family's kitchens and bathrooms, often in total darkness, and measured the developing times of film by whistling the last movement of Brahms' first symphony at a metronomic pace of two beats per second. Their friends nicknamed them God and Man. Jokes aside, Kodachrome was a huge leap forward. With the advent of cameras cheaper than my kidneys, this literally put color photography into the hands of all people. It still wasn't cheap, but it was at least more accessible. Don't fact check me because I'm not entirely positive, but the price of a roll included the cost of shipping it back to Kodak for developing, wrapping up the entire process into one neat purchase of a few canisters. Kodak would make several improvements on the original formula invented by God and Man, but the film was so widely popular, Kodak continued to sell it until 2009. Now some of you film nuts in the audience just had a little spark go off. Yes, 2009. That means out there in the ether of eBay, there exists expired rolls of this stuff that probably still works. But I highly advise against spending your money, unfortunately. The color of the film is incredible, but it should look somewhat familiar. The contrast and vividness of the colors, the deepness of the blues and bluish cast present in almost all of the photos. Still don't recognize it? Kodachrome is a color reversal film, more commonly known as a transparency, positive, or slide film. Its thankfully resurrected relative is ectochrome. All that really means is that the film itself 
is in color as opposed to a negative that anyone over the age of oh my god like 25 now has seen when reluctantly going through their baby pictures with their partner and mom what this means for photographers developing their films however is a difficult and abnormal developing process with hard if not impossible to come by chemicals just like ectochrome's e1 through 5 the K14 process for Kodachrome was discontinued with the film itself and is today nearly impossible to develop on your own. And I don't think any service is going to be able to do it for you. And if they can, it's going to be expensive as hell. Although I think developing it in black and white is still possible. But seriously, don't buy it. It's a waste of money. Just buy some HP5. I see you opening another tab. Speaking of Kodak, they were also at the forefront of color negative films. Kodak Color, released in 1942, was the first that I could find of a commercially available color negative film. It was similar to Kodachrome in the way you paid for developing with the cost of the roll, but with Kodak Color, you had the option to have color prints on paper as well, sold separately of course. Something not easily done with the positive Kodachrome. Although after years of Kodak dominating the film market, keeping their chemistry to themselves and making you pay for developing up front, as well as selling you prints, they inevitably got busted and trusted, forcing them to distribute their chemistry to other labs and allow some sort of competition. Such an FDR move. A modern day equivalent to Kodak Color would be something like Portra or Kodak Gold, though only because those are our only Kodak made color variants that aren't just motion picture film really, not because I think they produce similar results. Now those were two of the biggest advancements made that I think are relevant for us to cover. Please correct me in the comments if you feel I'm wrong. There were a lot of really cool and experimental films made during this time from Aerographic, which is a beautiful infrared. If you want some powerful images to look at, please view Richard Moss's uh, photojournalism at the crossroads. To Polaroid's development of instant film, which revolutionized the photo taking process entirely. It worked essentially the same way that other emulsions did at the time, with the caveat that the development would begin as soon as the photo was pulled out of the camera by crushing the chemistry packets and spreading it over the undeveloped film. And of course, Fujifilm and Agfa operated and created their own version of films. They just weren't quite at the bleeding edge of what was going on like Kodak was. Those are honorable mentions, however, that I think would be a bit off track for us to cover in their entirety. Something we for sure can't cover in its entirety is the next evolution of color photography. An advancement that, like the move to film, would make the art of photography easier for the world, but unlike film, would have a serious set of disadvantages. Digital photography is ubiquitous to the point that nearly everyone carries a camera in their pocket. And if I haven't already, I want to make my bias understood. Forest Hill Film Labs has completely radicalized me into not trusting digital storage methods and enjoying the process of taking photos as much as the end result, which most don't get when they have essentially limitless shots in a similarly shaped tool. But digital cameras for nearly destroying an entire market have come from very humble beginnings. Digital cameras began development in the middle of the 20th century but it wouldn't be until 1972 when the first color photo was unveiled. The photo was of Michael Francis Thompson's wife and it used a CCD sensor, although Wikipedia seems to be a little torn on this fact. Now when discussing digital photography, it's important to understand what a sensor is. The two big ones are MOS or the updated CMOS and CCD, and both are still relevant today. Essentially, they are light sensitive grids that when exposed to light measure how much is bouncing off of each pixel and then shift the charge they've collected to a storage container. The biggest difference I can tell between the two is how they shift that charge. Now you might say, Jazz, if these sensors are only measuring light reflecting off their surface, won't that image be grayscale and have no color because photons don't inherently reflect color? Yes, you are right, and that's because you're the smartest viewers on YouTube. By 1967, both sensors advanced to the point of taking color photos with the invention of the Bayer filter by Bryce Bayer of Kodak. However, as you remember, this image was taken in 1972, four years before the Bayer filter. The reason for this is a tough one to track down. How did Thompson take a color photo in 1972, four years before the Bayer filter? 
which enabled digital sensors to capture color information is invented. I don't know! Now, I believe it was because he used a technique adorably referred to as 3CCD, where you take three CCD sensors and place them around a prism and the light reflects red, green, and blue onto each. I, however, cannot for the life of me track down a source that definitively says that that is how Thompson took the image of his wife. So if any of you can find a website, book, or magazine that I haven't already that explains exactly how this photo is in color, please share it with me because it's 4 a.m., I'm tired, and every day this question looms over me. The Bayer filter, which is still largely used today, works by creating a grid of pixels, 50% of which are green, 25 are red, and 25 are blue. When a picture is taken, the sensor records the amount of light present and the filter will only allow the light of the color it is designated to pass through, through. And this is kind of the coolest thing on the planet. It is a combination of two of the techniques and ideas that were pioneered in the late 1800s. Autochrome Lumiere's color filters, only allowing light reflected by certain colors. And since James Clerk Maxwell's color filter experiment, we have learned that the human eye has more green cone cells than red and blue, hence 50% of the Bayer filter being green. Even with advancements like the Bayer filter and MOS sensors, it wouldn't be until the 1990s when color digital photography started to make its way to consumers. Kodak made the first attempt targeting the professional market with the Kodak DCS100. It was a retrofitted Nikon F3 with interchangeable backplates, allowing for a 1.3 megapixel CCD sensor to be changed between a color and monochrome variant. It also had this stylish gigantic battery storage over the shoulder thing that stored nearly 200 megabytes of images. The DCS100 retailed at a whopping 20 grand and surprisingly didn't see much use. However, in 1994, Apple of all people would partner with Kodak and release the Apple QuickTake 100, the first color camera under $1,000. It sported a 0.3 megapixel sensor and while it could only store eight photos at the full resolution of 640 by 480, it was completely self-contained and was attainable by the public. At the close of the 1990s, the first camera would be put onto the back of a flip phone, setting the standard for most amateur photography done today. Digital had some growing pains, like with this atrocious floppy disk camera from Sony, but the digital format would continue to improve and grow in popularity. By 2003, digital overtook the film industry, driving it to near extinction. Kodak, despite being a big sensor innovator, simply refused to adopt digital as a serious alternative to film and would slowly lose the faith of its customer base, which was watching digital get better and better before its eyes. And it was 2007 when the Apple iPhone was released, becoming the most prominent digital camera to this day. Digital photography had a rough start. But the ease of use and excitement for the emerging tech was just enough to trump the quality of film. And all sensors needed once film had been pushed to the wayside was time for innovations to be made to increase megapixel counts and storage capacity. Leading us to today, iPhones still dominate the market, taking almost a fourth of all photos yearly. But prosumer options have reached to the point of almost matching even 8x10 film images. I find the most amazing thing about photography in the digital format is just how much of the screenplay era was utilized to create the technology. Secrets uncovered when cowboys roamed the west put in place to form the image sharing culture we have today. I didn't go into theories, mechanics, or iterations of a lot of these processes like additive and subtractive color processes, stereo autochrome, or different types of digital filters because they're all unbelievably complicated and while I can track down a magazine from 1973, understanding what it's trying to tell me is a lot. There is something haunting to me about the color photography of the past. To look at some of the photos from a hundred plus years ago and to see people rendered so realistically is still so abstract to me. I feel through fiction we're usually supposed to think of the people of the past as mythical and in a romantic way they kind of are, but these photos show us just how little we've changed. These people of raised today could exist alongside us no problem, and not seem out of place at all, and likely vice versa. 
the same exact laws of physics that allowed those images to be made and brought the spirits of the distant past to the present were tapped into time and time again by some of the smartest among us, allowing us to not only keep our memories, but vivid records of our proudest and weakest collective historical self. Historical self. <laughs> oh my god. Thank you so much for watching this video. I know it's nothing like what I've done before, but um, I think it's fun. I think it's fun to experiment with things and uh, try something new. I'd like to do more history, like super niche history videos, but we'll see. Um, links, there's links right here. You can see them. Uh, I exist in those places and uh, yeah, I'll see you.